I was born in Harrisburg, Mississippi, uh, the year 1911, April 2nd. Uh, I went to what was then known as the Little White Schoolhouse uh, behind the railroad track in a Jim Crow community, which was the lot of all black people during those days. And uh, I went across the railroad track in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, and went through the, uh, uh, in the Third Ward, and went through the uh, sixth grade. My father was a sawmill worker. He was the breadwinner in the family. The weekly wage was pitifully low. And in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, the picture to children of this day, and I'm certain for generations yet to come, is one in which they will be asking uh, uh, Mama, Papa, how come? Black people was segregated behind the railroad track. The railroad track was the dividing line established during the period of child slavery. And the dividing line during that day continued to exist in 1911, the period in which I was born. And uh, what did it mean to be beyond the uh, railroad track, behind it? It meant that black people, economically, was at the bottom of the social ladder. Adults, as well as the young, had no opportunities beyond the ghetto. In this segregated community dominated by Jim Crow. It meant that politically, they had no right of equal citizenship, beginning with the right to vote. Uh, this was a denial based upon poll tax, based upon grandfather clauses, based upon terror, legal, extra legal, and to think of black people running for office was unthinkable, was impossible, because there were party primaries, Democrat, Republicans, and blacks were excluded from either. But also the Possibilities of uh, advancement, becoming men and women of dignity, holding their head high, uh, living and working and operating on the basis of economic, political, and social equality. This, too, was unthinkable. But in addition to everything else, cotton, which existed in the whole of the South, we call it in those days, the Solid South. In those days, we talked about Dixocratism. In those days, to guarantee that white supremacy ruled white supremacy of the type of the Bilbo's. This was reinforced by KKK terror, reinforced by lynchings, and the use of governmental authority to make blacks dependent upon the goodwill of the present day slave owners. 
When I had to go to the third, fourth, fifth grade on the other side of the railroad track, there were white boys living in a white community, a community that we had to go through to get to school, would always meet us with sticks, stone, bricks, and we had to fight our way through. And if one uh, thought that the law would come to your support, they had another thing coming. Nothing of the kind. This was a daily experience of black children who had to go to school in the third ward in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. Or you can take an uncle of mine who was lynched because he dared to speak up for the right to receive, should I say, adequate wages. When I came along, the prevailing thought, the prevailing consciousness that the black people would never in the United States achieve equality. This is the way the things are. This is the thing that will be. There were varying opinions. For example, the prevailing thought that if, say, through education, that in the by and by, someday, gradually, uh, blacks would reach a stage where some, if only a few, would be integrated into the larger society. And perhaps someday, through education, white people too would become educated. And they would see the necessity for being integrated. The thought that all of us are God's children. But that this would be require education. The question was never put education for what? Education for whom? Education for what class? These were not discussable questions. In the 20s, when I came along, I thought that uh, human nature couldn't be changed when, in fact, it could be changed. That human nature was class condition, was a class concept with its basis in class. I was to learn this later. And, and you'll be surprised when I... I wanted always to become a lawyer. My mother wanted me to become a preacher. My aunt wanted me to become a Duke Ellington. I did not see beyond that. Earning a living within the framework of things as they existed was my outlook on the, in that period. When the economic crisis struck in 1929, 
I was immediately thrown out of uh, school in my sophomore year. I attempted to wash dishes at night and go to school, but found that to be physically impossible. I had to give up one or the other. I gave up the school, you see. But my father also was thrown out of um, a job. He worked at the um, uh, steel mill uh, in Kansas City. Uh, he had brought the whole family up, you know, from Hattiesburg. But then, like millions of other unemployed throughout the country, the problem of staying alive uh, was a very, very big question. Lynchings. If I recall correctly, uh, during that whole period, some 6,000 lynchings had occurred uh, through the South. In Marysville, Missouri, uh, not so far from Kansas City, a black man was burnt. He was strapped down, burnt on top of a schoolhouse. The question did arise, uh, is there not an answer to all of these things? So there used to be uh, a daily gatherings of many unemployed um, in Paseo Park in Kansas City, Missouri. The unemployed gathered there and naturally debates on every kind of question. Iconoclastic science, for example. Uh, questions of the uh, Republican Party uh, and its uh, betrayal. Questions of uh, the Democratic Party, uh, its uh, base being the Solid South, the Dixiecrats, uh, big questions about should there be silence when men and women were being evicted from their homes because they could not pay rent. Uh, what to do about welfare why should people be dependent upon charity, philanthropy? Why shouldn't there be uh, a certain city responsibilities, state responsibilities, federal responsibilities? How and what should be done to promote economic, political, and social equality. It was in the course of these uh, discussions, debates, you know, that one day I saw a white man and a black man together selling the daily worker. This was my first introduction to communism and the Communist Party. Black man, white man, working together, and each of them saying that lynching should be abolished, that there should be welfare, relief for the unemployed without discrimination. Black and white, and especially white, protesting the frame-up of the Scottsboro Boys, Angelo Hearn. How could this be? The Democratic Party was uh, lily white. In fact, they, their base was precisely that of the Solid South, 
and they promoted, supported policies which could not but help feed lynching. The Republican Party had long since forgotten its role in the abolition of child slavery and did nothing on these. But even more, it was Hoover who was the President of the United States when these things hit. I concluded that this was the hand to shake. The fact that this black and white persons were selling the daily worker, calling for organized public opinion to act, to put an end to lynchings, to support movements for unity and uh, action of black and white to help meet all of the economic problems which flows from a criminal policy of those who ruled the United States. The big moneyed interests, the racists, and the political organization which helped to sustain and promote it. I've never heard this before. I never heard that it was possible to change things. This was an answer to the question that you can't change human nature. This was a tonic. It was a voice representing the fundamental interests of the people bringing hope and encouragement. What these communists said and did was to be proven to be absolutely sound as it worked to affect unity of the people, unity in struggle, the organization of the most advanced sectors around this kind of program for action, this attracted me very much. And so it was not long after that that I began in Kansas City to attend forums in which all kinds of topical subjects was thoughtfully uh, presented. And I saw that these discussions led to action, that deeds match words, and whether it be on the front of civil rights, on the front of the economic and uh, social needs of the people, the communists were there. I joined the Communist Party because of this. The fact that uh, they beat you becomes a fact that is uh, quickly known, the proper conclusions are drawn that you're dealing here with a force determined, as they put it in those days, quote unquote, to keep black in that place. This meant second class citizenship. And it was part of the largest struggle. You quickly learn this, that this is not only anti-black, it is anti-white as well. I learned from this. And that is the thing that, uh, among others, has strengthened me. But better men 
than I have experienced much, much more. So this was a question of uh, paying dues, which enable one to defend democracy, to extend democracy, uh, to satisfy the needs of the people. This was a contribution to America. And all of these beatings was uh, designed to keep me from making this contribution. Well, in the YCL, I think that this was a thing of beauty. By this, I mean that black members, white members, worked together, fought together as equals. The democratic discussions that took place were in fact democratic. And that young blacks, together with young whites, would discuss policy from its beginning and conclude that policy. And you knew by experience that it was black and white. And it was based upon a struggle against a white ruling class. I was to learn later that without unity, it was inconceivable that one group who exploited could succeed without unity with another group which was exploited, oppressed as a nationally oppressed people and as a race. All of these things emerge, the commonness of our task togetherness, and if you mean by this that white chauvinism did not exist, I would say, and I believe that it's uh, necessary to understand, that we work not in a vacuum, that outside influences express themselves from within, and even white young people who are so advanced in their thinking, who are trying to separate themselves from ideas and habits of the old, and of the class that rule things is bound to be affected one degree or another by influences which come from a class. And a class of which and for which it is not these white youths. And, uh, and one of the most beautiful examples, it seems, it seems to me, of how to fight. And one of the things which inspires blacks, that there are white men and women who battle bigotry. But you see, they go through the same process of learning as black folks do, too, you know? The problem of class liberation. One can even go further the elimination of class exploitation. Now, it does turn out to be true that in the Soviet Union, they were the first. In the world to solve the national question. And to solve the national question means 
first of all, to remove the basis for national pressure. This means taking uh, the profits away from those who profit from inequality of people. But this was not Stalin's idea. It was Lenin. And Stalin learned this from Lenin. Remove profits from those who maintain national and colonial oppression provides the basis for solving questions relating to equality and the correctness of this basic concept of Marxism-Leninism has proven to be true. Even today, when you look at the Soviet Union, the Russians, quite unlike the period before 1917, exist on a plane of equality with the 14 other Union republics in the Soviet Union. But I would say that people who uh, develop this kind of thinking do so out of considerations uh, that has aims other than the elimination of the system of capitalism. Does not see the struggle for democracy and its relationship to a higher life for the people. Therefore, they develop theories about something coming from, quote unquote, Russia, not being applicable to the United States. Now, of course, you have a different situation in Russia of those days than you had in the United States during those days. But the problem of oppression, whether it exists somewhere, or Oshkosh is the same, is oppressed by one class or the other. Now, it's a line of uh, argument which says we should not be concerned with geometry because it's not, a ma uh, uh, not applicable to America because geometry comes from the Greeks. It has that much sense. Or that radium should not be used in the United States because this came from Madame Curie, from France. And so you're dealing with questions of principle. And the uh, approach to freedom of men, of women, of children is universal. It has a universal truth. Now, when one apply that truth, they have to take into account the specific condition in each country. Now, I hasten to say uh, that in my opinion, this was a slogan which for that period was justified and correct. And we drink from the fountain of knowledge from whatever source and use it for social advance. This is the case in natural sciences. Why shouldn't it be the case in social sciences? So I think that people uh, in debate should deal with uh, substance and not form. I think the greatest of all mistakes was when the party for a brief period abandoned 
the concept of Marx and Leninism, an abandonment which meant giving up the class struggle in the United States. I think that this was uh, an era which was bound to have negative consequences on the party, an era uh, which did not help to advance the cause of struggle for the working class and for the equality struggle of black people in the United States to defeat fascism. to stop, on a world scale, the Rome-Berlin-Tokyo Acts. At home, to defeat the efforts of the America Firsters, to defeat the National Association of Manufacturers, to defeat the sit-down of big capital, a la Henry Ford, and to defeat the Ku Klux Klan and other reactionary forces in the country. There was a common interest existing between all of these class forces who had as a single aim to defeat fascism, not to retreat a single inch from maintaining what masses has achieved in blood for this country, naturally under such circumstances. There was an activization of all democratic forces the communists who sincerely devote themselves to the struggle for democracy and see it, socialism only in relationship to it was activized as well. There's not a group in the country which did not grow as a result of fighting for democracy. And people felt freer to give their true feelings to the communists who they saw on the firing line for democracy and anti-fascism. Now, after the victory had been achieved, then these same mixed class forces find themselves in a situation where they are takes place a differentiation among them. Some want to stand still. Some wish to go back. And many of them all want communists not to profit from their victory to which they gave so much. Uh, it was Karl Marx during the Civil War even, who uh, brought to this country, first of all, and, but also to the world, that labor in the white skin can never be free, so long as labor in the black is branded. This is a, an axiom in the part. Now, this does not mean that the party in the struggle against white chauvinism did not make mistakes. I, being a member of the National Board of National Negro Congress, worked with others uh, to project for the first time in the United Nations a petition, a statement, in regards to discrimination against blacks. That's the first time this has ever happened. This was uh, soon to be followed by a statement 
uh, William uh, uh, B. Du Bois. This was later to be followed by William L. Patterson's We Charge Genocide, and so forth. Uh, we were struggling because the uh, problems of blacks was uh, uh, connected with the problems of blacks in Africa as well. But any people, uh, to put it front, there was a substitution of what is decisive in our party. Uh, the maximum use of the educational method, the ideological struggle, throwing that overboard and making primary administrative uh, measures of expulsion. I don't agree with that, neither does the party. Fascism was around the corner. It was a period in which there was not only a danger to democracy in general, but a danger to the Communist Party in particular. For example, um, 135 leaders of the Communist Party had already been indicted under the Smith Act. These comrades remember that during the Palmer Raids, that whole period, that 10,000 communists had been rounded up and put in jail. And um, they see this as a possibility, as a growing danger. The mistaken uh, concept that um, You need the perfect man. You need the perfect woman. You need to do things in rapid fire order. You need people to do on the basis of command. You fail to see the need for the educational processes. We don't have time for it. The danger is upon us. But this is a very, very big mistake, as I see it. The principles for which we were fighting, I would gladly fight for those principles today. I think those principles were correct, and they were At that time, uh, a reaction to the ways common to that period to fight for democracy. It was quite clear that, uh, look, Galileo had to face in his day Jefferson Adams had to face reaction in that day. Harriet Tubman, Garrison, had to fight in that day. And they were fighting for principles of moving society forward. This is what we were doing. The fact that reaction 
proved at that stage to be stronger than we. Does not mean that reaction will always be stronger than we. That was the case with the British in 76. It was the case with the Jeffersons, the slaveocracy. 61 to 65. Well, I thought uh, it was necessary. And I will not say that at particular moments there was not fear. I, but fear should not prevent me from doing what I think to be right, what I think would serve the cause of the people. When you read that hound dogs are after you, and you recall that this was the lot of uh, black people during slavery, after slavery, out of which grew the um, old spiritual, wade in the water chilling, because it is said that the hound dog will go to the water's edge. This is how you can escape chattel slavery. People supported you. That was the Underground Railroad. And to repeat, when you are active in the fight to defend the interests of people, act in ways that give patriotism meaning you are able to survive. You know the class enemy. You know that they are racist. You know that they are bestial. Well, you have a choice to be a coward or continue the fight for the people, knowing what the end may be. This, this was how I looked upon things. I think it was a struggle for a correct line, how to affect it. And the best way to do that is to preserve the integrity of the Communist Party. I did not agree with those who took a revisionist line uh, the essence of which was to give up the class struggle, which was to give up the party. I thought this was inimical to the interests of the class, to the interests of the nation. Even present day events show that those who took this path were wrong. They took a path towards individualism. They put individual interests above the interests of the common man, the common woman. You see, There are those who feel that uh, they wasted 20 years because they are now wallowing in richness, riches, material riches. Why should I struggle for others? Better struggle for myself. Me, me, me. Well, it was not this, that I joined the Communist Party. I understood there would be ups and downs, but that the right path will be found. I believe that path 
has been found. I believe that the Communist Party is here to stay. As long as they're working class, you'll have a Communist Party. You cannot destroy the working class. You cannot destroy the Communist Party. Whatever the stratagems, by setting up organizations with the name communist in it, whether by attempted infiltration of the Communist Party, this is part of the struggle. It will not be successful. So you can see, I was very happy uh, to come out of prison and find a Communist Party with a present and with a future. Because I don't think that social problems of the country can be solved without a Communist Party. Event after event shows that when the Communist Party has been an integral part of movements such as the organization of the unorganized, the mass production interest, that is when democracy has been more secure. That is when the people has improved their living standards more. This is true. To destroy the Communist Party, if they could succeed, would result in destroying democracy. 